Hello, Manchester, and uh, Hooks it in Auburn, and whoever may be watching us through their computers and uh, being prepared for another edition of the Progress Report. Uh, no doubt everybody's noticed that it is the 1st of July. The nation's birthday is coming right up. Uh, and uh, and uh, because this is the first Wednesday month, I have the great privilege of welcoming my dear friend and longtime servant to the state of New Hampshire, Senator Lou D'Alessandro, the Dean of the Senate, Chair of Senate Finance, and he's with me here today, and uh, which is always a great pleasure. And uh, today, uh, because the Senate uh, met for the last time uh, on June 29th, yes, and the House met yesterday at the Whittemore Center, yep. which still seems a little weird to be sitting on the floor of a hockey rink wearing okay. your shield or your mask, right. and that's the House, New Hampshire House. And that's where we met yesterday for a uh, fairly long day. And uh, so the, uh, the, the work of this, this legislative term is pretty much over. We both houses will have to meet uh, later in the uh, summer, maybe late summer, early fall, to deal with overrides of the bills we worked on. And uh, both houses had to give up on a lot of things that we'd hoped to accomplish because of the uh, inability to meet during the COVID crisis that's affecting us all here in the country and certainly us here in the state of New Hampshire. So we're going to try and do kind of a legislative wrap-up today, folks. Uh, Lou's already posted about that um, just recently as he was acknowledging attending a um, Goffstown High School ceremony at uh, Delta Dental Stadium, Goffstown being part of the territory he represents along with much of Manchester. And uh, so that's, that's what we got in mind today. As always, we hope we'll have some participation from uh, our viewers by calling in at 340-3091. Uh, that would be uh, very, very welcome. I hope this won't be too dry and interesting because, as Lou often says, what the work we do in the legislature, for which we all get paid $100 a year, whether we're worth it or not, that work does in some way affect every person in New Hampshire. It affects all of us. So we, this time we have bills that are going to deal with how we're going to do our elections, how we're going to deal with the COVID-19 crisis, how we're going to deal with many, many things that are very important. And we still don't know how much of the many of these bills are going to stagger across the finish line, which recalls getting past the governor's veto pen uh, in, 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 I think, every case. And we know that last year the governor vetoed a record high 57 bills, 57 bills that had been passed after considerable legislative work and deliberation in both houses. I think the previous high was like 15, and the average for governors is like half of that. But he vetoed 57, and the indications are he's going to exercise that veto will be in pretty vigorously this summer. So we may be coming back to deal with a lot of veto overrides. And um, Lou and I are both in a situation where we represent parties that have strong majorities in our respective houses, me the House, him the Senate, but we don't have the two-thirds majorities that is required to override a gubernatorial veto. So if their vetoes are going to have to have some help from our Republican colleagues, if we want these bills, or many of them, those that will face the, the veto pen if we want them to become law. So that's the shape of things as we head into this weekend that we're going to celebrate the nation's birthday. And what's that going to be like for everybody out there? You know, we're not having fireworks in Manchester. There's no new Boston parade, one of the big events around the, the great city of Manchester and the Manchester wider environs. There's uh, a lot of things not happening this time because of that, but there are, there are good signs. The Curry Museum's planning to reopen in August with some very interesting uh, protocols. Uh, that'll be nice to have that back, and um, we are reopening downtown a little bit. And um, so I hope people have some. Uh, have some, I hope I hope it's going to be a great weekend for everybody, and that uh, we'll all enjoy and celebrating the uh, birthday of our nation as. Long ago, predicted by John Adams when he signed the Declaration, he said yeah. he, he was an amazing guy. He said, and you know, in the future, this, this event is going to be celebrated with illuminations, which was the <laughs> archaic <laughs> word for fireworks. Boy, he got that right. We like our fireworks on the 4th of July. No, we don't. And apparently you'll be able to see a good fireworks show at the Delta Dental Stadium, thanks to the Fisher Cats. Uh, but you'll need, to, you'll, need to, you'll need to get a registration to get in. But that's, we're not having baseball in, the, in Manchester this year. That's, right. that's something that's a grievous loss to me. I enjoy the Fisher Cats a lot. Right. Oh, absolutely. I usually take in several games and really right. enjoy the experience. But there will be things happening. So 
There we go, Lou. That's my intro for the day. Well, what do you want to start off with? Well, well, well done. First of all, Bob, I'd like to start off with a, uh, a commendation to the great Robert Backus on his retirement from the legislature. Oh, thank you. Uh, Bob, uh, you've been a friend of mine for a long time, uh, well known throughout the, the legislature for your work on the environment, securing a positive environment for the, for the current people of New Hampshire, the current dwellings, and those that will come in the future. To make it a, a healthy, safe environment, one that, that prospers. And uh, if I could go back to to Rachel Carlson's book, The Silent Spring. So uh, you're going to make sure that we don't have silent springs. I hope so. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm pleased uh, with that. I'm pleased. Well, to, thank you so uh, much for saying that, Lou. I've gotten many fine uh, uh, people come up and said many kind things, but I, uh, none of them are more appreciated than what you just said. Well, thank and you. I. Believe me, I'm going to miss this so much. Uh, I just really am. But uh, I think for me, the time has come, alas, and uh, and my wife definitely thinks the time has come. She would have been happy if the time had come last time. And well, uh, it's bittersweet because I'm leaving when so much work that we put in is not going to come to fruition right. in forms of actually changing the statutes of New Hampshire that govern us. But there well, it is. This was this was a, an extremely difficult session, and I think we should we should. Uh, give a quick summation of what it was like. Remember that the legislature did not meet for three months. For three months, we could not go into the state house. We could not go into our offices. We had a very great deal of difficulty interfacing with our, uh, with our brothers and sisters who were members of the legislature. We had to do most of our committee hearings virtually if we had committee hearings. Mm -hmm. And, and that's very difficult. I mean, we have this new technique called Zoom, which I think is fantastic, but nothing beats being there. Uh, and, and the ability to look at a piece of legislation, to question a piece of legislation, uh, and to be uh, you know, eye to eye, face to face with the person who, who you're dealing with. So that was a great loss. That's never happened in, in all of my time in, in the legislature. Nothing like this has ever happened. We've had the great Alstead floods uh, when I was in the legislature and you were in the legislature. We've had the Seabrook riots, and you remember those vividly, I'm, I'm, I'm sure, where we rounded up I, I would prefer to call them the Seabrook protests. The Seabrook protests. Uh, the Seabrook protests where we rounded up thousands of people. And God rest his soul, Bob Whalen was commissioner of Health and Human Services, and and I was on the council in those days. and. Uh, and uh, Bob Whalen had to handle that situation, and he did it with, with real delicacy, real respect, in a true, uh, gentlemanly fashion. I, I really think he did. And uh, if, if there are if there are complaints about that, uh, bring them to me because I'll defend Bob Whalen, and how he how he performed as as commissioner <laughs> of health and human services. He did a great job. And the interesting thing about that, of course, that's very strong in my memory because oh, sure. I was very sure. active in the whole issue right. about the Seabrook licensing, though not a member or I ever got arrested. Uh, I'm kind of sorry I never did, actually, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because, uh, you know, uh, at the height of it, one, uh, one protest ended up with 1,400 yes. and 14, 1414 people being uh, apprehended, charged with trespass and housed in various armories around the yes. state, including the one here in Manchester. That's correct. And um, the uh, Exeter District, uh, the Hampton District Court uh, was then the, the uh, chief, the judge there was a guy named Whitey Frazier. Francis Frazier, the and government I believe major. they're about to name that courthouse they, for him. They, they uh, are. Him and one other. We think that was one of the bills we passed. Ap absolutely. And he, he looked at this, he says, well, we're gonna let these people out in their personal recognizance, aren't we? Aren't we? Aren't we? <laughs> and the governor at the time, a fellow named Meldrum Thompson, Meldrum Thompson, quite a character, said, no, we're gonna, we're gonna make these people serve time. Yeah. Wow. And it's a classic example of be careful what you wish for, because what happened out of that was the clamshell lions bonded like they never had before. It wasn't just, yeah. you know, being at the fences or, right. you know, spending a night uh, waiting for the rally the next day. Now they were together eating and sleeping in these farmers, and they, 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 they formed these great, uh, these great bonds that continue yeah. to this day. And well, at one time in your, in your New Hampshire Senate, Lou, and I'm sure you were there at the time because you're the dean of the Senate, Three of our state senators in New Hampshire had arrest records at Seabrook. Uh, uh, Bev Hollingworth, Bev Hollingworth, Cliff Below, Cliff, Cliff and Below, Burton Cohn. Uh, uh, Bert Cohn. <laughs> Imagine well, that of a house of twenty-four senators, right. three had arrest records at Seabrook. Right, and Bev became president of and the Bev Senate. And Bev became president of the Senate. President of the Senate. Uh, 
Bert Cohen became majority leader of, yeah. of the of the Senate, and uh, the, the who's the third one that Cliff Bilo. Cliff Cliff was a uh, was a prominent member of the Senate who became uh, a member of the Public Utilities. He Commission. was a com- commissioner was of the Public commission. Utilities Commission. Still very yeah. active. Yeah, very, on very energy active. issues in the yeah. state and uh, in his city of Lebanon, where yeah. he's very active and yeah, in doing many fine things. Sure. So, but it, but indeed, nothing like this has ever happened for the first time in the hit. First time in our history since the Civil War, the Senate met in the House chamber. First time that's happened since the Civil War. The House met outside of its chamber for the first time since the Civil War. And met. for the first time ever outside of Concord. Right. We went met. to Durham to the UNH, met to the Whittemore UNH Center. At the Whittemore Center. And so, we were spaced out on the floor of yeah, the hockey rink. Right. And so, uh, I got to say, Lou, uh, UNH was absolutely phenomenal. And a great place. And what a wonderful place. I mean, they just treated us with unbelievable uh, care and attention. Uh, I can't say enough about that great university that we have as the yes. head of our... We have two great research universities in New Hampshire, Dartmouth and UNH. They're both level one research universities. Yeah. But what they did at UNH for us from the, uh, you know, providing everything, shuttle services in the parking area to the, to the floor of the arena... Uh, they even had to uh, agree to uh, uh, temper their own COVID-19 requirements. You're not supposed to be in a building at UNH without being a, without wearing a mask. Yes. Well, we have a certain number of people, not right. not on our party, but in the other party, that don't choose to wear masks. They think it's just their liberty. They they were put up in the uh, you know in, in the one corner of the spectator section in the arena which they chose to call a freedom caucus, I would say not, not, that would not be my choice of words. But UNH had to agree to weaken their own COVID-19 protocols to permit that to happen. And um, I, as I say, I just can't see that much about it. As we, as we were leaving yesterday, they, they'd catered our lunches very nicely for us, all brought to your seat in a, in a nice lunch box so you could eat and not mingle around. And everybody was separated six feet. And everybody was wearing a mask or a face shield. Mm-hmm. And on the way out, they, they, they offered each of, each of us a nice cookie to, to enjoy on the way home. I mean, mm-hmm. it was just a very, very great uh, effort by the University of New Hampshire. Mm-hmm. I'm so proud of our school. Mm-hmm. And a credit to Terry Paff, who uh, is the, the really the, the person who keeps the state house running yep. keeps, and keeps uh, agreed upon by both the House and the Senate to be really our our operations manager of the legislature. He's done a magnificent, magnificent job. job so the, kudos to the PATH man, yep. and to and, and to all of his staff. All, yep. all the staff were superior. But yep. but I, I mean, you have a situation where the third largest legislative body in the English speaking world doesn't meet in its chambers uh, for a three month period. I the last time I was in my office was on the thirteenth of March. The 13th of March, a Friday, the 13th of March. And then on, on that next Tuesday, the governor declares a state of emergency and it's all over. So they close up the state house. Yet you, you couldn't go in and get materials that you had. Say you were working on a bill. Yeah. And I was working on a bill. I was working on a, 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 what I thought was a significant piece of legislation, which uh, got, got killed in the shuffle. But I, I didn't have an opportunity to go back and and spend the time and, and, and effort that I needed to spend working that piece of legislation. So here we are. We're, we're, we're sort of separated, and yet we have to stay in contact, have to stay in contact with, uh, with our caucus and with those in the, in the Republican caucus and plan for legislation. And there were almost 500 bills left, Bob, that were not taken care of, almost 500. Uh, I looked through those, and I'm naturally not with a fine-tooth comb because you, you just couldn't you couldn't do that. But I looked through those pages after pages after pages of House and Senate bills, and some of them very worthy bills, very worthy bills that we weren't going to have an opportunity to give a full full hearing to. So on the, on the Senate side, the House, uh, the, the the Senate Democrats and the Senate Republicans agreed. Uh, Senate President Donna Sudi, Susi and Senate Majority Leader Dan Feltus, along with Minority Leader Chuck Moss and, I guess, Minority Floor Leader Jeb Bradley. Jeb Bradley, got together and started going picking through the bills. They went through the bills. 
the bills that needed hearings, we had these virtual hearings on. And that, by the way, was another tricky situation because at first we didn't have Zoom. We, we finally purchased the Zoom package, but we were using the package that, that was used by the Office of uh, Recovery. And, and that was the dial-in situation. And that was pretty difficult. I yeah, mean, you, I, you that would be tough. You couldn't, you couldn't do anything. So we got the Zoom package, and then the, the uh, committees began to meet. You had to call in. That's pretty, that's pretty difficult and make yourself known. You had to sign up on the list. But it worked. You know, it worked. Was it perfect? No, nothing's perfect. But it worked, and, and the government marched on. The governor declared a state of emergency. That state of emergency exists to this day, and it will exist, in my opinion, through the summer. I think that's, qu that's quite clear. It's going to be through the summer. So we functioned. We met for, the, for these two days and, and these two, two special, special situations, and we went through 100 bills. When you look at the, the omnibus bills that were put together, Bob, they were intermingled in those bills, a uh, 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 hundred, a uh, hundred different pieces of legislation. Now, they were generic in that they all had some bearing and, and were put in one category, with the lead bill being the, you know, the, the bill that, that was amended. But it, it went through and, and it worked. And you guys got those bills, you got them yesterday and voted on those, those bills. And I watched some of the votes. And some of them were close, some of them weren't so close, but at, at least they got a full hearing and, and they, were, they were worked on. Because some of those things had to be done. They just had to be done. The election situation had to be dealt with. Yep. You know, and the bills that the state agencies needed had to be yes, dealt with. Yeah. And, uh, and that was a big part of some of the omnibus bills. Looks like we've got a caller here, Lou. You want to see what sure. Eric's got to say? Is he there? Eric, are you there? Eric, are you with us? Eric? Yes. Oh, okay. Hi there. Wow. Welcome. You're, you're, you're Welcome to the Progress Report. You're loud and clear, Glad Eric. Glad to have you with us. You're Go loud right and clear. Ahead. Thank oh, you. Uh, hello, uh, hello uh, gentlemen. Good evening. Good hey, evening. Just a question I heard on the, on the radio just a few minutes ago, and I've heard there were some rumors around it. They're thinking about uh, uh, sending out another stimulus check for $1,200 by the end of the month. Or I heard the uh, uh, President Trump say it might be more. Do you think that's a good idea? Well, first of, first of all, that's federal legislation. I haven't heard anything about it. What I've heard is that there's another significant package being debated in the House but is being rejected by the Senate. I don't know the full content of it. My, my, recollection, right. was, my recollection was it was to do something to aid the states who are coming up with deficit budgets for fiscal year 2020. Uh, but indeed... Uh, it could have another stimulus package. The the twelve hundred dollar stimulus package, I, I think, worked to, to some extent. It helped. It helped people. Uh, I think the six hundred dollars on the uh, on the unemployment had some positive and some negative ramifications, which we we have we have to deal with. Uh, I think the, the the increased stipends for the mental health people and the, and those who are working in the critical care areas that were that were uh, sponsored by the governor, they, they certainly were worthwhile. So a lot of things were done to help things out, but it, it's very hard to, 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 to understand what's going to happen in the future because our National Congress uh, isn't working as smoothly as one would want. That's for sure. Right. I'd like to make another quick comment. The, sure, uh, of course. People are wondering, the, uh, it's like a pretty easy procedure. I called up uh, City Hall a while back, even though they were technically close to uh, coming inside. They sent me the absentee ballots, and I'm going to be voting in September or November, right? Yes, and yes. On the uh, ballot at home, and then I'm going to put it back in the box over at the uh, City Hall here in town. So if anybody interested in doing that, it's definitely an easy process to avoid all the lines and all the confusion going on at the. Uh, if they're afraid of the, you know, of the virus at the at the uh, polling agents. It was right. a pretty easy process. I've never <clears throat> done it before, so kudos to uh, downtown City Hall. So. Well, I think that's... Uh, 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 that. Yeah, sure. Those are great comments because voting is, is going to be different this time. It's going to be more different than it's, right. ever, than it's ever been. People are going to be afraid uh, to come out and vote. They're going to have to keep their space at the polls. They're going to have to wear their mask at the polls. So anything that makes it right. makes it easier uh, makes a lot of sense to me. I figure by next September when we vote again for the mayor and aldermen and all those minor 
minor details, I call it. <laughs> I mean, it's not minor detail, but the, the people don't come out in droves. I feel a little bit more safe coming out next September, November or so. Yes, yeah, I, I'll well, leave it at that. Right, I think, well, I think right. you're right. Thank you so much. All right, Thanks thank for the you. call. Those are good comments. We appreciate them very much. And that was one of the things that we acted on, wasn't yes, it? Uh, yes, we, we have now made it a matter of law, assuming the governor doesn't veto this one, which I can't imagine, that uh, fear of the COVID-19 is a sufficient reason to cast a ballot by mail, an yes. absentee ballot. Yes. That was not clear whether that was sufficient uh, excuse to get an absentee ballot, but now it's going to be very clear, and the Secretary of State had supported that. So. Yes. And so we are looking at a very different election this time in September and again in November. Right. There will be a lot more people voting absentee. I yeah. think a huge number would dwarf anything that's previously been attempted. And I understand that they're now, they're now going to, I guess legislation dealt with this too, going to permit the absentee ballots to begin to be, uh, you know, run through machines uh, as early as uh, Thursday before the Tuesday election day. Otherwise, it would be a tremendous crush. And, you know, typically up until now, you're about halfway through the voting day at the polling place, and then somebody comes in with a bunch of ballots from City Hall, and these are the absentee ballots, and the poll workers have to open them up and check them and make sure they seem to be uh, proper and then feed them to the machines at that time. Well, with the amount of absentee ballots that we're expecting because of this, this crisis and the uh, desire to maintain our social distancing, and the, the poll workers have to have that concern too, and the, the, the procedures will change. So we won't be going, I guess, to an entirely mail-in ballot system, which has been tried in other parts of the country, I think seven states, but the uh, mail-in ballots, uh, absentee ballots, will be a much bigger part of the election than ever before in the state of New Hampshire, and I think it's appropriate that we've arranged for that and are getting ready for that. I think uh, the, the commission that was headed by Brad Cook had uh, senators and, and uh, representatives on it, I think did yeoman work in coming up with a reasonable plan for dealing with the election. Now, now another important ingredient was who's going to pay for the stamp if you mail in your ballot. Yeah. And I think the Secretary of State has agreed that, that the state will pay for that. That's they good. Got, they got $3.2 million from the, from the federal government to work on election reform for this, uh, for this election. And uh, this is a presidential year. It's usually a very, very high turnout year. Uh, as, as we've mentioned, the virus may inhibit people from coming to the polls, so they have a chance to, to vote not only in, in the general, but the, in the primary and the general, they will be able to vote, to vote absentee. And there will be no reason stated you can vote absentee because you wanted to vote absentee. You know, you don't have to get a doctor's certificate or, or something of, of that nature. As, uh, made, oh, you, you know, you, it's a no excuse absentee I, it, It's a no excuse. I thought it was just to permit people to have fear of contacting the COVID well, was, a, was a sufficient reason. I didn't know they went yeah, the whole way and I, said, I, you know, you don't need to give any reason at all. I, the way, uh, I, that's what I thought. So, you know, um, again, yeah. the, the, whole, the whole reason for doing this was to allow people the greatest opportunity to participate in the in, in the process, and to do it in the in the in the easiest fashion. So yeah. the, that it, the, I'm sure that the governor will will concur with this. I mean, he wants people voting. Uh, yeah. And uh, th this this allows uh, for that. You now, in the past, you had to, you, you has to had to have almost a reasonable excuse. Yeah. Uh, for for getting yeah. an absentee ballot. You were ballot. supposed to have an absolute reason why right. you could not be at the polls. Right. Nobody checked up on that, but you know, people right. didn't want to lie about right. it. Right. So but it's yeah. good that this has been taken well, care I think of. It's, it, it's very it's very very important, and it was a critical issue in in the process. I know that. Uh, Senator Levesque was very involved with this. Senator Sherman was very involved with this on our side. And as I said, Brad Cook was chairman of the, of the committee. And he's been on election law, uh, and he's been head of the ballot law commission for a long time. A long time. A, a long, a long time a serving member of that I commission. I think they did a terrific job. We had yeah. Brad as a guest here. Yes, and, that's right. And did. Uh, he did tell us about this and yeah. really sang the praises of the, the people who worked so hard, yeah. including Senator Sherman and Barbara Griffin from Gosstown. Yes, yeah. And uh, oh, I can't remember all the others, but uh, it was a it was well, a, it's a very solid commission. Very solid commission with good ideas. Yeah, so, working uh, hard to, to get things done. Yeah. So you, you did mention just a few moments ago that they're going to name a courthouse in Hampton after Francis 
Whitey Frazier. Francis Whitey Fa- Frazier was my fraternity brother in college, was my teammate on the UNH football team. I was an usher in his wedding. No kidding. <laughs> yes, and uh, I'm friendly with him to this, to this day. Uh, a remarkable guy. From he Cl- happened to take the bar exam and, and, and pass the bar the same year uh, I did. Remarkable guy, uh, Bob. From, from uh, Kennett High School in Conway, New Hampshire, uh, came to the university uh, as a, a really an outstanding athlete in high school. Huh. Didn't play a lot of football, but he, he was a, a skier, being from the North Country. Yeah. Uh, and uh, became just a wonderful, a wonderful student, a wonderful member of the, of this, of the student body. Uh, married a, a, a young woman from Keene, New Hampshire. God rest her soul, Joyce Lenatowitz. Was at their wedding, and uh, the family loved football players. So it was a wonderful time, a wonderful <laughs> bachelor's event and so forth. And we stayed at a farm in Troy, New Hampshire, be, the night before the wedding. And, uh, and Whitey, was, uh, Whitey was really at, in his prime, uh, had, I think, five or six children, and his one of his sons works at the Department of Revenue Administration. John, who, who is just one of the finest state employees that we have, mm-hmm. one of the finest. Uh, the governor <laughs> appointed him to that committee uh, to divvy out that fifty million dollars. So you know, it's a small state, Bob. We're isn't small. It, it, we're yeah. a small state. And and I I made a little speech on the floor of the Senate before we left, and I said, you know, we're only twenty four people, and. We should remember everyone who served here, pay homage to everybody who served here, and get to know the people who served here. It's a little different in the House. I was in the House for two terms, but, but in the Senate with only 24. Yeah. And, in, and a, a recent passing is a guy by the name of Ted Snell. I, I don't think my, my colleagues remember Ted Snell, but he was in, he was in the Senate in, in 1970. He was a 1962 graduate of the University of New Hampshire. He was there when I was in school. He then went on to become alumni director at the University of New Hampshire and was very helpful to every alumnus in the state. He really was. He was that kind of guy. He followed George Bamford, (coughs) open arms, willing to help, great, great asset for the university. He then went to, uh, to, to Seabrook as the director of public relations for the Seabrook Greyhound track. No kidding. Oh, and he was, he was sterling. And then he was in the racing industry for, for most of his adult life. He passed away in Florida. And I, I, was, I was shocked when I got a call one morning, and it, it was his son who was calling me to let me know that Ted had passed away. So as I said, it, it, it's, a small, it's a small world, and we should remember one, one another. And I, I talked about that on the floor of the Senate. I said... We're, such, we're the third smallest Senate in the United States of America, the third smallest. So obviously we ought to remember who served there, <laughs> and, and we should, we should uh, re- respect those people. And, and uh, I might say there's, there's nobody left from the, from the day I started in the Senate. There's not one senator left. No kidding. The turnover. And the turnover has been pretty heavy li- lately. So, but, but, any, but anyway, just and, and in the House, Bob, you're leaving the House, and you've made a mark in the House. I remember my first my first term in the House, Section Three, Seat Eighty Three, as far away from the rostrum as they could put me, <laughs> in, in the in, in the you know in the in the middle in the middle, so you'd have a difficult time getting out yeah. to speak. But uh, a, a great experience. I was with Paul McEachran, yeah. and, and John Sununu. Yeah. Sat in the last row, yeah. who then became governor of the state. A lot of memories in that legislature. Oh yes, Bob. there are. Yeah, and uh, please, you just can't forget them. And and the service and a guy like yourself, very very prominent, distinguished lawyer in our state, gives time. <laughs> you know, gives time to go. Yeah, and it's and, been a and, pleasure and serve. to do it. Yeah, as but, I'm sure it has no, been for you. Uh, it, but it's, it's, you want to make a difference for yeah, people. Yeah, right. you want to make a difference, and I think the pr- the pressure and and, and the disturbance that took place at, at, at this legislative session, we had, we had nothing to do with it. We didn't invent the virus. It just came upon us. And the idea was, how do you deal with it? Yeah. How do you deal with it as a legislature? Yeah. How do you do, deal with it as the speaker? How do you deal with it as the president of the Senate? How do you keep the engine moving? It yeah. has to go because people, people have to be served. And, and we yeah. talk about legislation. 
legislation has to has to move forward. Yeah, and it's got to be. Which is why vetted. you know I really was envious that you seem to have a more collegial group in the Senate between the parties than we do in the House. Uh, to me, the most distressing thing that happened to us was in our first foray to UNH at the Whittemore Center, which was on uh, June 11th. Uh, the first thing we wanted to do was to uh, have a motion to suspend the rules so that we could forgive the fact that the usual deadlines had passed because we couldn't right. do business because we were all locked out and uh, could move forward with uh, dealing with our bills. And the minority party absolutely refused to join in the suspension of the rules, which takes a two-thirds vote. Yes. Uh, I think that was highly terrible and irresponsible. They had a certain quid pro quo they wanted for agreeing to suspend the rules, and that had to do with, you know, not, uh, not proceeding with the next uh, scheduled uh, small decrease in the business taxes if the state revenues fell a certain amount, 6% over projections, right. which seems very likely could happen. But to, to, in order to make their point on that, they were willing to jeopardize everything that we had worked on. All the committees had all reported in with their positions on these bills. Many were not very partisan. Many of them had strong bipartisan yeah. support, which was proved by the fact that at some point during that session, after they failed to give us the few votes that we needed to suspend the rules so we could do the people's business, somebody moved to adopt the consent calendar. Well, as you know, and I think probably many out there know, but maybe not everybody, the consent calendar re re reflects those bills that have come out of committee with at most maybe one or in an exceptional circumstance, right. two dissenting votes out of 20 or 21 or 22 people. Right. They are overwhelmingly supported by both parties. They would not agree to suspend the rules so we could adopt the consent calendar and get the bills that we all agreed on, or essentially all. Yes. Even those bills could not be advanced uh, you know, to the governor for consideration for becoming law. I just think that was a dreadful thing to do and cost us a lot. And uh, it, it, it just, it's just so bad that, uh, I mean, uh, why, why, how, can, how can you justify that to yourself? You know, we're, we're all sent up there to not to stop things, but to try, well, stop bad things, but try and do some good as well. Right. And here we, here we had bills that had such overwhelming support, they were on the consent calendar. Meaning it's just a voice vote to right. adopt the whole yeah, consent calendar unless somebody pulls a particular right. bill off for some reason. And they would not agree to suspend the rules to permit that. And the other thing I thought was very important is, you know, we have really struggled to, to, to meet as, as the Senate has. And yes. You have this the House chamber where you can plenty, yeah, we're, we're, plenty we're, of room to social justice room to for 24 really. <laughs> the 400 member chamber. That's true. But we had a much more difficult time to find a venue. We ended up at the Whittemore Center, as I've been saying, at UNH. That's the ICE arena. Um, and, uh, and it turns out that the reason we had to do that is because the only time the House is not required to meet in person is if in, in the event of a foreign invasion. That's in the Constitution. Right. And so the Speaker of the House, Mr. Shirtliff, a fine representative and yes. city councilor in Concord, uh, came down to the floor to, to urge that we pass a bill to just eliminate those three words event of four, whatever, three or four words, in foreign invasion, because of foreign invasion. And so it could, we, could, we could meet um, <laughs> remotely like other legislatures have done, including the House in Massachusetts. We could do that um, through remote technology, which we all have today. We're talking about Zoom. Zoom right. There's other platforms to use. Yes. Some of the state agencies use other platforms. We could do that and not have to go through this agony of, you know, showing up and trying to find a place that can, we can all be six feet apart from each other and wear masks and develop new technology so we can record our votes, which they had to do at uh, UNH. And there was no agreement that we could bring that forward for a vote. I mean, I just think that that is obstructionism of the worst order, and it's something that I, I will lament as part of my, this has been an interesting last year in the legislature for me, to say the least, but not, mostly not in a good way. And so I'm, I'm very upset about that. And frankly, I don't want to be unkind to anybody, but I hope that the people that did this, the Republican leadership, I hope they pay a real price for this in November. Because I think, folks, I think you out there, you may have a great time denouncing politicians. Everybody likes to do that. But I think you want the government to do the work you sent us there to do. I don't think you want the government to just be shut down by arbitrary and unreasonable demands, which I think this clearly was. So I am hoping that there's going to be a huge vote, huge vote, 
mostly by mail perhaps, but some by in person. Whatever it is, I hope it's just a huge vote because when we have a big turnout, we do better. We do better than when we have a small turnout, and it should be a huge turnout this year. So that's my rant on that, Lou. (laughs) Well, I don't think there's any question we're going to have a good turnout. Uh, You know, know, Bob, uh, having served in the House for for two terms, I I can say in in many ways it was a great experience, and in some other ways it was a very difficult experience. And when you you, uh, see uh, some things happen just because people are angry at one another, it doesn't make a great deal of sense. You know, I think we have to get along. You can disagree, but you shouldn't be disagreeable. Right. And, and when things make sense, get get them done. That's what democracy is supposed to be all about. And yeah. as, you know, as a teacher of, of civics <laughs> at the high school level, many, many, many years ago, I would I would teach uh, uh, teach my class about. Uh, some rancor that took place in the House of Representatives at the national level when there were actually shootings on the floor of the House. Uh, but we, we, we've calmed it down. <laughs> we've calmed it down a little bit. We went from those the rough ages uh, to uh, a sense of stability and and, uh, and somehow some kind of congeniality. Now I think that the the disruption has surfaced a little bit uh, around the country. And we, we've got we've to bring that back. Yeah. We've got to bring collegiality back. It, 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 we talked about, you talked about the Senate. I think the Senate has a very collegial relationship. Uh, Chuck Morris, who was the president of the Senate, now he's the minority leader of the Senate, um, very reasonable, amicable guy. I get along very well with, uh, with Senator Morris. I have a great deal of respect uh, for him. And and I think, generally speaking, he speaks very highly of the president of the Senate. And that's a great collegial relationship, and it's under that framework that you get to things done. Are there a lot of 14 to 10 votes? Yes, sure. But there were a lot of 15 to 9 votes also. Yeah. And, and as, as a result of that, that collegiality uh, becomes apparent, and, and you've you got to have that because when you You've walk out of that, cha- that. when you walk out of that chamber, that. Uh, you want to you want to be uh, you have a relationship with a with a person, and if that person needs something. You, I'm sure you'd be willing to help them out if if, if you could. Right. You know th- those things are important, and when you get a body as large as our house, I mean, well, with with 400 people, you're you you jammed you you are jammed in there. Right. I mean, truly, and you get to know your neighbor. You get to know the person on one side. You get to know the person on the other side, as you do in the center. But I, Peter Chassie, I, I'll remember him to this day. I walked into the house in 1973, Bob. Peter Chassie was from Summersworth, New Hampshire, and he told me his one of his great secrets was he bought his cigars in Maine because they were cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> and and he, was, he, he, worked, he worked in the mill and he carried, a, he carried a clipping in his wallet. His house was broken into and he fought the person who broke into the house. And Peter Chassie <laughs> carried with him until his passing the clipping about that incident. And, and just a, a great guy. And on the other side was Paul McEachran. Oh, yes. And uh, the great debate, or one of the great debates, Bob, was the contents of ice cream. Putting the contents of ice cream on, on, the, uh, on the, the, you, the facility that it came in. And the, you know, if you, if you bought a pint of ice cream, p- had that pint filled, the contents. McEachran one of the contents of that of that ice cream spelled out. <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you, it was it was it was quite it was quite an experience. And in those days, he was a young lawyer, and uh-huh. and you know, beginning beginning his uh, uh, his uh, service to the state. And yeah. he had, and Paul had a, a very good very, service, very, very yeah, good, very good service to yeah, the yeah, state. Good service to the know, state. And, wonderful and, yeah, and wonderful think, guy. Ran for oh, governor three ran, times. Oh yeah, think of uh, of of so many. So many great people. I think of the of, of the distinguished Kim and Zakis. Yes, you know, um, a dem- I mean, a Republican, but uh, just a wonderful guy. Yeah, uh, a wonderful man who gave his time to the legislature, yeah. served a couple of terms, was deputy speaker. Yeah, um, did did some did some great work, and also did some great work for our city. So as you as you recall your days uh, in in the legislature, Bob, you know you're going to sit back and uh, and think about boy, think about all those people, 
the men and women that you served with. Who, I'm going to miss them a lot. Yeah, I'm going to miss them a lot. That's, that's you know, one of the things one of the things that happened to me when, when I was in the, the the minority leader on the committee, uh, the the ranking member, as they call it, was that the chairman at the time, a fellow named Dick Berry from Merrimack, called me up before we started and just wanted to introduce himself and uh, say what his goals were and find out what mine were. I really appreciated that. Yeah. So when I became chair, I did the same thing to the new ranking member, a fellow named Mike Harrington, a former PUC commissioner. And that paid dividends beyond what you can believe. I mean, yeah. we had our disagreements for sure. We had, Bill, we debated on the, in the Whittemore Center yesterday on uh, uh, net metering. Oh, yes, net metering. And, uh, and uh, he had Fred Plett from Gostown got up, and then he did a PI on it. But he came over and said he was really going to miss me, and uh, and we worked together very well. You yeah, know, we, sure. it doesn't mean we don't have our policy disagreements. We no. do. Um, I will. I, you know, that makes me think of one thing. You know, when I first came to the house, the speaker was Terry Norelli, uh -huh. and I think she was a fine speaker. And she came up with the idea after the O'Brien years, when things were so partisan, oh, the atmosphere right, was awful. rancid, just rancid. Yes that we would not sit uh, segregated by section, but we would sit interspersed, Republicans with Democrats. And so I got kind of got used to that, and I met, yeah. some, I met some interesting people that way that I wouldn't have got so close to, because sure. they would have been in section one so, and section right, two, and right, I would have been four or five. five right, sure. And, and, uh, and that's the way it was going, and then this, this term started, and I'm sorry to say the, we did, did not get asked as a caucus to give our opinion on this, but the Republicans came to Speaker Shirtliff, or about to be Speaker Shirtliff, I can't remember, and said they didn't want to do that anymore. They wanted to be seated all together in sections one and two on that side of the House. Yeah. And he let them do it, because yeah. that was what they wanted. But I think something was lost there. I think the idea sure. of not, you know, saying my friend across the aisle, well, my friend's not across the aisle, he's sitting in the seat next to me, you <laughs> right. know? Right. And I think that that was a uh, move toward collegiality I, I hope can come back in a future legislature. Well, you know, the, the, uh, the, the Speaker can lead the, the House as, as the President can lead the Senate. And um, Steve Shirtliff is just a wonderful man, kind, generous guy. Yeah. Very, very a, decent. A nice, yeah, he's just self deprecating a, sense right, of but, humor, but, which but, disarms people right, and is but really delightful. Just a really super nice guy. There are times when when you have to make the the tough decisions, and the 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 people who who do that, I I think end up with with very positive results yeah. with very positive results. Yeah. Uh, for example, the decision to to uh, have you meet at the Whittemore Center, Shortliff had to make that decision. That had to be his call. He did it. He did it because he thought it was in the best interest of the body that he served. And you have to give him accolades for that. Give him kudos for that. Yeah. Because I'm I'm sure he's he's he has taken a lot of flack for that. Yeah. A lot of flack for that. There was cost involved. Yeah. Um, and a, and a number of, of a number of other things. But he did it. It was a tough tough decision. And when when I first came to the house, and we're kind of reminiscing at this point. And we are a little bit. That's okay. Uh, the speaker of the of of the, the House of Representatives was Jim O'Neill. There was not a nicer guy in the world than Jim O'Neill, the Earl, the Earl of Chesterfield, the Earl of Chesterfield, a wonderful, wonderful guy. And I might say, Bob, that I wrote one letter my time in the House of Representatives. I got to write one letter, and, and, <laughs> and that letter was, was about SSI, Supplemental Security Income. And I had a piece of legislation that, that supported that. And Jim Cleveland allowed me to write that one letter. <laughs> yeah. And it's a lot different now. I mean, you have at least a little bit of staff, a little bit of support. I mean, not, not what you really need, not what the majority or the minority leads. But Jim Cleveland was, was just, a, 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 Jim O'Neill was just a wonderful guy. Kimmon was his, was his deputy, and, and Kimmon, uh, Kimmon, had people towing the mock. Yeah. And so it was, it was a great... Um, this is Jim Cleveland you're speaking of? Oh, no, no, Jim O'Neill. Okay. But, uh, but, I think yeah, you said Jim Cleveland. Yeah, I did, I did. Because yeah, okay. Jim Cleveland, I think he was in the House for a while. I think he? he may have been. I don't yeah. remember. That he was quite said. a while ago. Yeah. Yeah. And, and think of uh, think of when Walter Peterson was Speaker of the House. Yeah, yeah. And, and Walter served two terms as Speaker of the House. Yeah. And uh, so, so, so we have... So, have 
we had some giants who served as Speaker of, uh, of the House. Now, who could forget Marshall Cobley? Yeah. You know, God rest his soul, Marshall. Uh, <laughs> what a character. He was a character. He was a character. He really he, was. Uh, he, he, he certainly was. was one. <laughs> if you could, uh, he did write a book, right? Making Sausage was the title of it or something yeah, like that. Yeah, he even conned me into buying it, which oh, I... Oh, yeah. And he conned me. <laughs> I never really thought it was he, worth what I paid for. <laughs> <laughs> he, he conned me. But he into, had some good stories. Uh, yeah. he, he sold it at one of my fundraisers. <laughs> So Marshall was uh, an, an interesting guy. Yeah. But but in but in, indeed, uh, as as you go through this process and think about it, what's what's the future hold, Bob, for for, uh, for the citizen legislature? Is there a future for the citizen legislature? Uh, can people? I know the turnover has been great lately. Yeah. Uh, can people serve for a hundred dollars a year? Uh, can they take well, you it? know, yeah. we, we can't do much about that because that's a constitutional yes. limitation. Uh, and uh, it's, it's kind of wonderful. There, I guess there is one legislature where they don't get any pay at all. It's New Mexico, maybe, I'm told. Don't I don't know. know. Yeah. Uh, but the $100 is just, you know, it's not nothing, but it's, it's, it's almost more insulting than nothing. Right, 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 <laughs> it's not, right. we, we think you're worth being paid, but only $100 a year for all those hours. <laughs> right. uh, but, yeah, I think so. The, the only problem with it is, and as I say, we're stuck with it because it would take a constitutional change, and I don't see that happening, is that it, 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 it skews the Democrat, the, 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 uh, the uh, demography of the, yes. of the House. Oh, yeah. right. I oh. mean, the average age of the House, and I'm not helping on this, is 66, something like that. 66.6, I believe. 66.6, you know, and... Uh, and we have a lot of wonderful people, and I, uh, I'm not going to say anything that uh, I can't help or people my age can't help, but we really would like to have more people that, that can't make the choice to serve because they're, 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 they have young families and they have to sure. be getting ready to you know, fund uh, housing and right. college, and, and they, they just can't afford to, to, to put in the time. Now, we have some wonderful young people, several here from Manchester, like uh, uh, Wilhelm and, uh, and Willis. Uh, who was a uh, teacher up at New Hampton School. How the heck he does this, I don't know. But he, he's in there and making a real, comp a real, uh, real contribution. And uh, so some of them may do it, but we, we could use more of that. We could use more of that to be a more representative body. And that would require that we find a way to pay people as, an, enough so that they can make it work for themselves to, to do this work for the, the benefit of all of us. Um, well, Lou, I thought we were going to spend most of this hour talking about some of the legislation we did, and here we're rattling along with some good mm -hmm. memories and thoughts about the general structure of the place, but I think maybe we ought to just touch on a few sure. of the things that got done. Absolutely. As I say, all we could do because of the Republicans' refusal to join in suspending the rules was to turn things over to the Senate, and Lou, just hold up that thing. Let's hold that up. That's the, that's the Senate calendar, 340 pages. Right. Normally this is a 10, 12, 14, maybe 20 page yes. document. Right. 340 pages, this right. is the one before the last one. And these are the amendments that the Senate put onto the House bills that were them so they could return to us and so we could vote up or down, concur or non-concur, which only requires a, a, a majority, majority vote. vote. It doesn't require a two-thirds vote. Right. This is the only way we could get some things done. Right. So I just wanted to touch on a few of the things that the Senate did that we, uh, that we affirm by concurring that seemed to me very important. Uh, uh, a family medical and uh, fa uh, family medical and uh, fam medical fa and family leave provision right. uh, passed. Now whether that'll get to be past the governor's veto, I don't know. It looks problematic, but you know we've never had that in New Hampshire. You know you've never you've had to risk your job if you have a child who has to be uh, cared for because he's sick or a parent or something, uh, or maybe your, yourself. So we did that. We passed a bill to at long last restore a minimum wage in New Hampshire. Yes. Do people realize that New Hampshire has no minimum wage, zip, nada, nothing? And that means we only default to the federal minimum wage, which is seven twenty-five an hour, folks. Yep. That is not enough to live on for anybody. I don't care how modest you are and how good you are at clipping coupons. You're not going to make it on seven twenty-five an hour. So that's been passed, and that will move to the governor's desk 
and it moves it up, I think, to, uh, over a period of time to 12 and ultimately yes, to, $15, to 15 dollars, right? Yes, it does. And we should have a minimum wage in New Hampshire, should yep, we not? We should. We should not rely on the federal minimum wage, which is way too low and hasn't been adjusted in a long right. time. Uh, we acted on taking down some uh, prescription drug prices. Yes. Uh, you want to talk about that one? Well, I, I think the, the idea was uh, competitive, competitiveness. Yep in terms of, of obtaining prescription drugs. And that was a bill that lingered for, for a number of, really, I think for a number of sessions, and it finally got through. Yep. Uh, <clears throat> so indeed, there's the opportunity to, to do that. And the other key key uh, bill along those lines was the insulin bill. Insulin bill. And the yep. cost the cost of insulin. Uh, that's a, I, I never realized that. And yet my brother... My brother is an insulin taker. My brother's a diabetic. Yeah, didn't realize the cost of it. So we did. We did pass. The, we did pass House Bill 12, 1280 relative to the copay. Am I right? Insulin. That means that you know you're going to be get insulin for thirty days for thirty dollars or something. Something like that. like that. Yes. And that's you know I think that's 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 yeah. affordable for almost everybody. I it's mean reasonable. we've had horror stories of people that could not afford the insulin, so they cut down on it and uh, and they. They ended up dying. I mean, yeah. you know, the, you know the, we, they say we don't want to ration health care in this country. We are rationing health care in this country by your income. Yes. That's, that's, that's the sad fact. It's yeah. not done, being done by uh, other means, but it's being done by the fact that you're just pricing life-saving drugs out of the range of many people that need those drugs uh, or their lives sure. are in danger. Um, we acted on... Uh, uh, approve the independent fact finders report yes. on the uh, state contracts. Right. Uh, our state employees, and they're a fine bunch of people by and large, working very hard for all of us, and they have not been without a contract for just about two years now. And we had an independent fact finding report. Now, this should be contrasted with what the governor was ready to do. He was ready to give the state employees a one time payment of $150. One time payment, $150. Uh, not sufficient. Uh, so we, uh, and there was an independent fact finder who made a report recommending these contracts be approved with modest increases, yeah. and we approved that. Yes. So there's another thing we did. And we, and we did that for, for a number of components of state government, we went right down the line, uh, and it covered almost everyone in state service. Yep, yep. So it was, and I think it was 2.8 and 1.6 yep. were the two, uh, the two elements. We, we passed House Bill uh, 1491 relative to the death benefits for public works employees killed in the line of duty and relative to working men's compensation offsets for certain retirement system benefits. That had been around for a long time. I think Mary Heath was the real uh, person behind that in, in the House, and that, <coughs> and that baby uh, that baby got passed. Uh, special education for older students relative to the provisions for special education for older students, House Bill 1558. And remember that every bill that came from the Senate had to be a House bill because the, the House would not suspend the rules and as a result wouldn't consider any Senate bills. Yep. But remember that attached to these House bills were a number of Senate bills. <laughs> so they were they were commingled yeah. and, and, and brought forward. And I think that created the omnibus nature of the bill. It was an omnibus bill and it was very important on our side that both the Republicans and the Democrats agreed on most of the content of those bills, otherwise they wouldn't have got across. Yeah. So there was lots more done, too. I mean, it's really quite surprising the amount we did get done given the refusal to participate in suspending the rules so we could use our regular procedures. Uh, unmarried people who are now in a loving relationship can uh, now will be eligible to adopt children. Right. Uh, and I think one of the most important bills on the veto I most regret that the governor handed down last time, even over the even, even more than the bills from my own committee, Science and Technology, uh, the establishment of an independent redistricting co commission. Yes, that's on there. <laughs> we have it again, and I only hope somebody can persuade the governor not to veto that this time. You know, every 10 years we do the census. We're all in the middle of that right now. And on the basis of that sentence, we're supposed to all redistrict uh, all our electoral districts, uh, federal and state, around the country. And, uh, and it's just been the pattern that if, if you happen to have one party in power, when this decennial you know, census and redistrict comes up, they skew it in their favor. And then, as happened last time in 2010, when the Republicans had a huge electoral victory that year, 
uh, gave us the O'Brien legislature, alas, uh, they really, really, uh, you know, use that process to benefit themselves. So we have, for example, we have some real oddities. We have one councilor district, councilor district <laughs> two, which goes from Maine to Vermont, right through Concord and right through Belfast State. That's a democratic area. And the price for that was they made the other, uh, the other districts much more friendly for, for inc- uh, Republicans, uh, many of them. In spite of that right now, it's a three to two majority for the Democrats and the Executive Council. But we have agreed as a party that we are willing to give up the advantage we would have if we have an election blowout this year, we are willing to give that up to, in favor of just having independent, nonpartisan setting of these things so they work every time without either party being deliberately disadvantaged. I know in the, uh, in the New Hampshire House, if the, if the Democrats running this year get 50% of the votes, they won't get the majority in the House. You need more than 50% of the votes in the state to get a majority in the House, and that's because of these gerrymandered districts that wonderful term that comes from a former governor of Massachusetts <laughs> who first did this, Governor Jerry. And so that, I think, is a, is a bill that yeah. I'm uh, so glad we got to, and I'm just hoping that somehow the governor will find it in his heart to say, yeah, let's, let's not make this a partisan exercise in power every 10 years as it has been. Let's do that. Uh, so that's one that a lot of people have worked very hard on. Yes. And yes. Uh, we also had a very uh, important bill, which I think has no chance of escaping the governor's veto. We, we actually passed an important uh, gun safety measure, called the red so-called flag red flag law. Yep. And that stands for th- th- situations where uh, people with guns in the house uh, um, have threatened people with those guns in that house. And, uh, and uh, we have now said that when that's happened, and by the way, that's that's the, that's the you know we have a we have a declining life expectancy in this country, uh, particularly for for men uh, in, their, in what should be prime years. We have a decline, and the biggest aspect of that declining life expectancy is suicides. And the number one reason we for suicides among men is the the the, the, the means for suicide is with weapons, firearms. Yes. So. Um, this, 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 of course, is very controversial because the Second Amendment absolutists uh, say, well, no, this is, this is confiscation of guns. We can't do it. It would only happen if there is a, a credible, verified petition that somebody in this house has used a weapon to th- seriously threaten others in that household, as I understand it. Is that right? Right. And that's, that's one that uh, mm-hmm. passed, passed the Senate on, on Monday. And... Uh, Senator Morgan gave an, an impassioned speech on, I read about on, on, that. on the floor on the floor of the Senate. Uh, a very a very important piece of legislation. New Hampshire is twenty five percent above the national average in terms of suicides, and it has been this way for a long, long period of time. And and the majority of the of the suicides have to do with weapons. Yeah. And when you're 25 percent among the national average, you you got to think about that. Well, we have just a, a minute left. Can I yes, talk I about? Can I talk about Peter Ramsey? Yes. Peter Ramsey, the man in the white coat, the celebrity of the Queen City, is our Citizen of the Year in Manchester. Now we can't have the big bash this year because of the uh, of the of the virus, but but Peter will be uh, acclaimed. Citizen of the Year in Manchester, and well deserved. Well, well deserved. Well deserved. I mean, that, he has been the the, 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 uh, the soul of the uh, along the with soul of the Palestine. The Palestine along with Sil Dupuy and right. John McClain brought it, before brought him it, brought it back, and, and he's brought it back. He's brought back the Rex. Uh, yeah, and uh, look, still looking forward to going to something in the Rex. Yeah. So they're going to have something there real soon. Just brought back entertainment, live entertainment in in Manchester. That's affordable. That's accessible, and that's well worth going to. Yeah, that's so, a, that's a good mention. Kudos, to, kudos to Peter. Peter, congratulations, congratulations, well deserved, and he served in the House too, by the yes, way, he for did. a couple of terms. He served in the House, and uh, mm-hmm. many people may not know this. He was one, among the first graduating class in our first law school at that time, Franklin Pierce Franklin Law School. Franklin Pierce Law School. Well, Peter's a, a just a just not a practicing great guy. law now. He's doing well, something I think uh, better for the community. He's working for <laughs> it. Yeah. And as we as we bring uh, us great shows. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll continue to do this show, won't you? You're not going to leave the. I'm not going to leave. You're not going to leave the television no, no. arena. As long as you're willing to come down and stand <laughs> with me for I'm, I'm willing to one, come. one Wednesday a month. That's a I'm, that's a good incentive I'm, I'm for me happy, to continue because I, I uh, certainly enjoy it. And kudos to Bob Backus for his service, 
okay. to the state of uh, to the state of New Hampshire. His dad was a a physician in Goffstown. They've got a bench named for his father just outside of the town hall. Yeah, and uh, that's a great tribute. That's a great tribute. Yeah. And I, it goes back to what I said about remembering and relationships and what life's really all about. Yeah. And uh, kudos to you, Bob, and the family, and thanks for everything. Thank you, Lou. Be seeing you next week, folks. I'll be back, I believe, with Mike Farley, and we'll try and post up what we got planned.